Okay, so I think I'm just going to start us off. Welcome to all of our attendees and thank you for joining us for this webinar that is presented by Folk Alliance International. There's just a few little things we need to cover before we start today's webinar. When you opened uh, the webinar today, a control panel has appeared on your screen. The link to access closed captioning live is in the chat box at the top. You can scroll up to the top of that. It's also in our handouts, which are available for you to access on the screen being displayed to you. If you want to hide the control panel, you can do so with the little orange arrow. And to submit your questions for consideration, you will want to use the questions menu in the control panel. Um, but for our content today, we're mostly going to be answering questions that were submitted in advance. There will be a live Q&A towards the end, but it will be brief. We received over 200 questions. Many of those questions were about the legal aspects of live streaming, and there were a number of super specific technical questions. So in response to those particular questions, we will be presenting more in-depth webinars on each of those subjects. Uh, one on the legal landscape of live streaming and the other on tech tips and tricks for successful streaming. Uh, and you can find links to those future webinars in that resources handout attached to this webinar. Don't worry, I'll remind you at the end. Um, when you close the webinar, a little short survey is going to appear and we really appreciate your feedback, especially learning from you what types of content you would like us to deliver for you. Uh, we are here listening, ready, willing, able for that. So let us get started. Um, before I introduce our panelists, we're going to launch a little poll. So our first poll is just to check in on the folks who are here and find out what your industry role is. So in a brief moment, ah, there it is. You're just gonna select one of those roles. Um, we'll give it a minute and then we'll post the results so we can see who's in, in the room today. Um, and if one of those doesn't apply to you, then feel free to not answer this poll. Uh, it occurs to me I should probably have put other for everyone else. <laughs> okay, oh, all right, all right. We have a nice mix of folks here today. Um, hello to everyone. We have one more poll that we are launching right at the top of this, and it is, have you hosted an online concert or presented an online concert before? Um, Please don't be shy if you haven't, just answer no. Uh, that will help our panelists to answer some of your questions in particular about um, live streaming today. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really nice mix of um, experts and novices, which is perfect for uh, an engaging conversation. So I am going to start by introducing our first panelists. Uh, they're together, uh, sheltering in place. Uh, Chris Matthews and Heather May are artists and social Hi. justice music makers. Hi. Um, they've been producing a concert series called Apart Together. Um, a former drum major and classically trained clarinetist turned folk singer. A very um, unusual uh, CV. Uh, Chris Truly. is using her voice to answer Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s call to be a drum major for justice. And Heather is an award-winning songwriter who tackles complex topics surrounding uh, LGBTQ plus issues, body positivity, racial injustice, and women's rights. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi, everybody. Let's dive right in. Can you tell us about the Apart Together series uh, and what prompted it and how it started? Yeah, um, well, it started because all of our gigs in March and April uh, were canceled and we had a pretty big run of shows. Um, and we also, at the same time, were getting messages from our fans because we are social justice songwriters and mental health advocates. We started getting messages from our fans saying, we need your music now more than ever. Please, please gather us, gather us together. Um, so we launched 
the first we call it the pilot show yeah. um and it was uh just like a lot of songwriters they do the first one and it's like this boom explosion and the out you know the pouring of of comments were just like we're so happy that you're still playing music thank you for showing up so it was after that that we realized we should do this regularly because people are scared right now and they need a place to gather um so it became this Kind of mulling over until we finally discovered that the what we wanted to do was become a part together uh -huh. and how have your fans uh chris responded to this series that it's been it's actually been really beautiful i think yeah. um so much of it for the series that we're doing which we'll talk more about uh hopefully later kind of finding out what the niche is that you're actually going to be able to fill uh, as an artist in this particular time. But for us, it's really been about creating community. That's kind of been the thing that has helped to keep the fans engaged and coming back like week after week after week after week is because we are sharing music, we are, you know, performing for them, but we are also being very intentional about actually building community. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that seems to, to keep them um, coming back. They, they are in desperate need of that. It's a very scary time. I mean, we are literally being told to isolate yeah. uh, from one another. And so to be able to safely isolate, uh, you know, to keep yourself safe physically but then um, emotionally and spiritually to still feel connection with others um making sure that we're able to kind of provide a space where folks can get that week after week after week and kind of check in um has been a really beautiful thing and so i love that you're talking about building community and the importance of that um can you can you both speak a little to how you build community, how you engage the, the act of engaging community in a two-dimensional yeah. online space, and then how you can do that without, it's a fine line between providing predictable content and then oversaturating, uh, you know, lots of present, lots of presentations are being made now. So maybe you could mm -hmm. just speak to how you're building community, what the intentionality is behind that. Definitely. So uh, the one thing that Chris and I realized is that um, in the comments, what, you know, we listen to our fans, what they say to us, we will adapt. And one thing that they were saying is that, you know, they miss the chance to like go to brunch with their friends or like hang out after church with their sisters or, you know, just go to like women's gatherings. So Chris and I came up with this rowdy concert series in our dining room where we play games with our fans and we do like trivia. And one of the ways that we change it up every week is there's a different theme for every week. So one time we did a theme on shelter and in the comments and we had them like talk about what are you doing in your home to improve your own shelter? Yeah. And then they compared and talked about those ideas. And we kind of center the set list around the theme each week. So, yeah. it, so it's like they aren't getting the same songs from us week after week after week after week. So, Because honestly, I would get bored with that too. <laughs> yeah. And like, I don't want to hear my songs every single week singing the same social justice music after a while. It's like you just want to do more. So we decided to do one was a part fundraiser and then like another was like Chris's birthday. Yeah. And so we had like a birthday party and celebrated all the people that were having birthdays during isolation um, and that has really changed it's not a concert it's a place for people to gather yeah. and they keep coming back yeah uh -huh. anything yeah. you want to say further to that Chris I do I think you know specifically for the artists because there are so many artists joining us today um, I will say it is we're kind of all trying to do this at the same time now we're, we're kind of all trying to figure out a way to survive and to be sustainable um in the middle of you know our job is literally to gather and the rule right now is do not gather and so yeah. we're kind of all very quickly trying to figure out how it is we get to do our jobs uh, and do them safely and so i just want to add you know because there are so many artists there are a lot of us doing this this thing right now and so in order to find your relevance in order to find what it is your specific fans need from you um, that they may not be getting from everybody else at this exact time is to figure out exactly what it is they need from from you for from us what they need is to to feel gathered and feel comforted and feel safe 
um, and get that that kind of warm hug that they often get when, yeah. when Heather May is singing smoke signals to them. Um, and so for us, we're able to find that particular niche. And so I just want to encourage all the other artists who may be feeling overwhelmed and, and worried about how saturated their fans are with online content from all their favorite artists right now. Don't be don't scared be. by that. They need something specific from you. Mm -hmm. Find out what that is and be ready to give that to them. Don't be discouraged by the fact that we're all doing online concerts right now. There is something that your fans are looking for from you specifically that you can only give to them. Yeah, I mean, they bought your album, right? Like they bought your album, they listen to it when they cry, they listen to it when they break up with somebody, they listen to it in the car and scream sing, right? So yeah. there's only one you. Yeah. So if you can find your why, yeah. then you can figure out how to make your concerts a place for them to keep coming back. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, where were you during my songwriting career? That's what I want to know. That was <laughs> very I'm here for inspiring. you anytime. Just text me. I'm here for you, girl. We're here for you, girl. You. Um, I'm going to move on to our next uh, guest <laughs> and introduce uh, her, and then we'll come back and sort of all have a, a melee of uh, togetherness. Um, <laughs> let's bring in our next panelist. Heather Gibson is the executive producer of Popular Music and Variety at the National Arts Center of Canada. And for those of you who are joining us from Canada, you are very well aware of the incredible job that the National Arts Center has been doing in uh, fostering an online place for folks to go and providing access for artists to uh, get in front of audiences they might not normally. Um, Heather's also the former executive director of the Halifax Jazz Festival, the founder and artistic producer of the In the Dead of Winter Music Festival, has served as the chair of the East Coast Music Association, many other things. And uh, Heather is going to speak to us today on um, how venues and performing arts centers and organizations can present artists and series online. Good day, Heather. <laughs> There we go. I'm back. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the NAC series got off the ground so quickly and um, just expanded so rapidly? Well, I think it's, you know, the, I'll do short the short version of what happened, but um, Facebook called me and said that they had seen in the media um, that there was uh, a lot of impact about to happen to the music community and was there anything that they could do and, and they wanted to put some money behind it. So um, we thought about it for a couple hours and came up with something called Canada Performs. And uh, the idea behind it really was at the beginning was to get, uh, and it still is, emergency money into artists' hands. Um, and so they started that with $100,000 and we committed to doing 100 live streams for $1,000. Um, uh, we had Slate Music come on, so that we, that was on the Monday that they called me, and then Thursday we did the first one. Um, on Saturday, Slate Music showed up with another $100,000, and on the following Tuesday, RBC and Sirius showed up with 200 each, um, so then we were at 600. Um, and then I got a strange phone, a strange email from Margaret Atwood wanting to talk to me, so, we added authors um, for another hundred thousand dollars from Facebook, and we've had private donors that have brought that up to about seven hundred and fifty. So we're doing seven hundred and fifty streams at a thousand dollars each, but it is in all genres because the National Arts Center is in all genres. So we've received about forty three hundred applications, um, and I would say that about thirty five hundred of those have been in popular music. Um, the second largest category is classical music. Uh, so when I say all genres, we do also dance and theater. Um, we do both languages as well. There's an entire French stream of this program. Um, so we were we had a different motivation, and so I think it was interesting what what Heather um, was saying there about finding your why, because some of what I did sort of in that couple hours of thinking when Facebook started asking if we wanted some money was figuring out what's the why of a performing arts center uh, in this kind of environment, and how do we contribute to to this and decided that the biggest, the quickest thing we needed to do was, was get some money in people's hands. And I started talking to, to some friends I'd heard over the weekend, artists saying that they thought they might have a month or maybe two um, before they would be in dire situation and need to sort stuff out. So 
it was that was where it started um and then it started you know it was kind of like starting a festival when we did the first one on thursday you know i had no idea if anyone would come it was kind of a thing of was anybody interested in this and um we made some decisions right off the top that i think turned out to be the right ones one is that we left all of the control in the artist's hands and so we're simply promoting these streams um, they live on the artist pages and um, we link to them onto our page that has allowed artists to aggregate their fans from different social media platforms. And I guess the other thing to go back is that this is not a Facebook um, thing. They just, they're funding this. They're completely agnostic to what platform people use, which has been terrific um, because people have come at this from, from wherever their fans are. Lots of, you know, particularly say in the author's world, most of their fans are living on Instagram um, and in, in particular in poets. So there's been a, um, we, that's what one of the choices we made was to leave the artist as the producer and we're simply um, pr promoting this through our Facebook. Um, we made other decisions about um, that the National Arts Centre has typically been about excellence, which I think if you're sitting in America, it's the kind of language you get from places like the Kennedy Centre or, you know, those things are in our little blurbs at the top about excellence. And, and one of the shifts for us was that I said to my colleagues that this wasn't about excellence, it was about good, and it was about supporting artists the way that they were capable of doing something quickly. Um, and so we've had some streams work magnificently and some not. Um, and you know, and ha I have no judgment on that either way. It's been a very authentic experience for, I think, both artist and fan and audience. One of the things that's happened from this program, because we also have um, tens of thousands of dollars from Facebook, on the back end and all these little Facebook hacks to go and promote things um, in people's pages is that um, it's been a huge discoverability in this country for artists that they didn't know, um, that people are, are viewing this now as almost like a live television, if you will, it's a live broadcast. We do 10 or 12 a day in different genres. And so from 11 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, you can come to our Facebook page or if you happen to follow an artist and, and go and see. So the discoverability has been really high. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to say is that the live streaming part has been really important. Um, we've had artists who wanted to record because it's because of quality and I totally respect that, but the program was set up as live streaming particularly. And what's happened is um, we've watched audience be very, very interactive with the artist as they go, um, probably more interactive than most artists would see at a live show because it would be like somebody interrupting the whole time. Um, but the other cool thing we've seen is we've seen the people on the stream talking to each other and it'd be like oh hey bob you're in colorado that's great you're home like and there's been this sort of like chip chat going back and forth and so that kind of um connection i think the audience is looking for i'm not going to speak for the artists we, we get feedback on how great it is to see all those little hearts and thumbs and everything else going scrolling up the side but the audience seems really um they don't want to just watch something uh, at right now, I'm not. I have no comment about once we get out of out of quarantine lockdown. Um, but right now, they're looking. They're seeking that kind of uh, that kind of interaction, that kind of connection. So that part is, has worked um, has worked really really well. And um, yeah, so I think it's you know we did this really quickly, but I think it's it's working. We're we're just about to cross three million views, which in Canada is um, the largest viewed. Uh, video content that's ever been put on Facebook is coming from our Canadian artists um, through this program. So, uh, you know, those are not big numbers for some American things or some weird cat videos, but but um, but for Canadian musicians, they're huge numbers. So, and we have a long way to go yet. We, we've got about 400 scheduled, so I have another 350 to go. Um, just wow, that's incredible. I know we have a lot of folks on this uh, webinar today who are from Canada, but we also have a lot of folks who are from the US and beyond some of our international delegates. So double question here. Hmm. First, part A, do you know of any similar initiatives happening in the US or internationally with large arts centers um, presenting in this way? B, what advice would you offer to a center who might want to engage in this way or a venue or yes that's my two part um, well they launched ireland performs uh about two weeks ago i think so ireland has this but it's through their culture ireland office 
The Kennedy Center launched something similar on Monday, uh, and Facebook and some of its partners, I believe, are looking at France, Australia, and uh, there's another country, European country. Anyways, it is they are all over the place um, starting to do things like this. What would my advice be? Um, just a minute, something, there we go. My advice would be that, um, well, you know, from a performing arts perspective, one of the things that's been great about this, which was a spin-off, is that it's a kept, also kept our funders and donors and government engaged. Um, and so that's been a really good thing, particularly on, uh, in Canada, we're reliant on those sources. And so to have a continued relevance or a new relevance um, to artists and audience in the country during this has been a very positive thing for us. And so that's been a spin-off. It's not something I intended to have happen, but I would say that if performing arts centers are looking at how do they do some of those things, how do they, um, and there are people looking to fund things like this. Is these, they're looking to how can we um, be a part of um, connecting artists and audience through this time. So I think there's opportunities that performing arts centers probably have um, those relationships in their communities. Um, we're talking to some people about how we're pivoting this for the summertime and looking at how do they, these people that we're going to work with in the summer change their sponsors from what they're doing now to doing this. So, so that's one thing. Um, and then I guess, you know, if I were to be really advice focused and not come across funny, is I would really encourage performing arts centers to move away from the idea that, that they're producing or controlling this and give it to the artists to do and to be a part of and to learn and and um, and not get work. We probably, out of the 350 we've done so far, 340, um, there's been like four or five where they've just turned it off and said, you know what, it's not working. And then they come back to me and to us and they reschedule and it's no big deal. Like it's just, the audience is wants to have that authenticity. And I think that if we get too involved and too, too concerned about it. Like it's one thing if an artist is that, and that's totally cool. Um, but let them have, this is, I've been trying to talk to, to my peers about how this is another stage. It's another stage and it's a different stage. And I don't step on the stage at, the, at, the, at Southern Hall and tell an artist how it should look and how it should be and how they should do this. And, you know, we have a couple of parameters going, you know what, it'd be nice if it was at least 45 minutes. We do that anyways on stage, right? We say, here's the set times. Um, but we're kind of, I'm trying to, there seems to be a thing amongst my peers to, to control this in, you know, that when I start answering questions, they want to, well, we have to do this, we want to do it this way and whatever else. It's like, well, yeah, but there's some kind of vulnerability to this. And the artists are super nervous. Like I've seen artists be more nervous doing this than on when they come and play on, on my stages um, in a live capacity because it's new to them. So it's like, Try, and, the, and the world without applause is also really weird. I know I don't know if that was somewhere in this thing, but like yeah, we're going to talk did, about that right here. Yeah, and so some of, I think it's sort of giving that that control over so that um, the artist can find this in a way almost this new way of expressing themselves and the new way of connecting themselves and their art with their audience. And we are kind of I think for me we're facilitators. We're not producers in this capacity. Um, we're just we're just promoting and facilitating and, and sitting back and going, you know, that was awesome and, and leave it at that. Wow, thanks Heather. It makes me think of, I heard you speak uh, in October at Folk Music Ontario Conference and you talked about how you are not interested in being a tastemaker or a gatekeeper. And that stuck with me. And it makes me think about the fact that defining your role as a gatekeeper when no one's allowed on the property uh, it's a role that just has to, you have to find some, another job. Um, and I yeah, I mean, I've always about. thought that, that, you know, and this is the same, I bring the same philosophy to this is that, that um, there's a certain, certain level for sure at the, at the National Arts Center that we're looking for of, and there can be, and those things are mostly, those, I would say they're almost entirely subjective. Um, but my job, and in this realm as well, and I believe with performing arts centers, our job is to figure out a way to open the gate and to be as supportive as we can, particularly through this time of like, you know, all of this that's going on, um, not to keep people at this, but that bar of excellence, it always bothers me. The bar of excellence is, is, has been created to keep people out. And um, we sometimes in traditional performing arts centers just keep moving that bar around 
Um, and so, you know, so there's some people who never, um, and very often, unfortunately, you know, we could go down a sideways path on this, but very often, unfortunately, it's people of color, it's queer people, there's all kinds of groups that don't fit when you put in a, a lens that is a, a, a traditional perspective, and, you know, I'm not really sure what the right words are because I could be offensive about it. <laughs> but yeah, our job is to keep, I think in this particular, we have the technology, we, we have the teams at performing arts centers, not all of us, but most of us do. And to just be supportive and have the marketing people to help. My whole team of technical directors have become social media technical directors. Um, and uh, yeah, anyways, I'll leave it at that. Heather, thank you. Uh, I definitely saw some of our other panelists clapping at various points through uh, what you were saying, the artists uh, on, on the screen. Let's move to our next um, panelist. Uh, Jonathan Bird is an award-winning songwriter from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Kakalaki. And in 2018, Jonathan created something called the Shake Sugary Americana Residency, which is a weekly three-hour show at a little roadhouse outside of Chapel Hill called The Kraken. It's in its third year. It has developed not only into a local community event, but an international online gathering place. It live streams on YouTube, Facebook, and several other platforms. And a nonprofit associated with it, the Shake Sugary Foundation, uses a percentage of the proceeds to support arts education for special needs kids at the Eastern North Carolina School for the Deaf in Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, Jonathan is also an online songwriting coach and an excellent one at that, um, I might add. Hi, buddy. How's it going? Hey, Tessa. It's going well. Thank you. Uh, you have been at this um, online streaming for a while now. You were ahead of the curve. And um, I wonder if you could share with us what, what pitfalls you found at first that you have managed to overcome. Um, since beginning your journey with online streaming? Uh, I, I feel like a consultant, really. Like the past few weeks, everybody is saying, how do you do the thing? <laughs> Everybody's shooting from the hip. And we've been doing it for about a year and a half. So we've learned a lot and I've kind of forgotten a lot. I've forgotten a lot of the mistakes that we made early on. I tried to just type something up here to guide me um, through this. And one of the things we did was, I had a bigger vision at first. I wanted to have like some fancy cameras and I got a DSLR and I was able to HDMI that into our hub and more trouble than it's worth. Everything that we do now, um, and if you watch our live stream, everybody says to me, it's the best live stream on the internet right now. Audio is incredible, video is incredible. People say, I feel like I'm there. Every camera is an iPhone or an iPod touch every single camera that you see. Just use your phone. They're, they're incredible. It's the, the cameras were developed by, by NASA spin, sending spacecraft to Jupiter to take pictures. The cameras are incredible. They're good enough. Just use them. Um, there's one thing that we learned was that we wanted to go to Instagram, but there's no third party streaming to Instagram. You either stream to Instagram or you can stream to everywhere else in the world. Um, so I just gave up on Instagram. It just wasn't that important to me. If your fan base is largely on Instagram, um, I would say yes, go to them, but also try to get that audience to go to YouTube or Facebook. YouTube is my favorite. It's the best quality. You can eventually monetize your content on YouTube. The audio quality and video quality, we even heard from just fans watching online. They're like, yeah, that's right, it's, it's the best quality. Um, and you can even just share, if you don't have like Restream or a multi-simulcasting service, you can just start your live stream on YouTube and then share it to Facebook and share it to Twitter and share it to, to wherever. And it's almost the same experience of watching your, your live stream on, on Facebook if you just shared YouTube to Facebook. Um, so we learned like, don't worry about Instagram. Other people in the house are going live to Instagram if there's an audience there. So we didn't worry about that at first. Now we don't have other people in the house, but we didn't develop that in the first place. Um, I would say don't try so hard to interact with fans online when you're live. Unless it's specifically an interactive event, put on a show and don't let yourself get too distracted by your devices. You're on the internet, it's the 
biggest virtual playground ever created. There's billions of things to do. You will lose people in seconds. They're not sitting in a chair in the room with you. They're at home and there's something on Netflix and they'll go away. So just like if you want to interact with people and you're and you're actually live streaming, maybe give yourself a minute or two in the middle of the show in your set list somewhere and be like, this is the time. I'm going to read some comments and say thanks and send shout out to fans online and then get back to the show and put on a good show. Um, we did try some more interactive stuff and it was just, it was too distracting to me as an entertainer to try to do it. One solution is, and this is also great if, you're, if your internet bandwidth is very small, you can pre-record a show and host a watch party. And the great thing about that is you can get online with your fans and interact with them in real time. Uh, and if you've been in the Facebook comments thread of a good live stream, we had about 350 comments uh, last Wednesday. There's a whole party going on in the con like people from different countries are meeting each other people like i'll mention something and somebody's like oh here's the link to that and they type it in and we have a couple of volunteers who like we never even asked but they just showed up they're like our they're our comment moderators they greet people when they show up um, huh. and it's just it's so much fun and then I'll, I'll just go on later and go through the comments and say hello to people and thanks for showing up and respond to questions and things like that the other thing that I started doing was on Wednesday morning, I go on Facebook, Instagram, and my email, and I say, please send requests. And then that afternoon, I make a set list out of all the requests, and then we play their requests. So that way, we're not having to constantly be distracted by watching out for requests. It's uh, interesting online. because you're talking about um, you're talking about like the interactive, the the request set list, and you're talking about uh, super fans becoming moderators of de facto moderators of your YouTube comment section, which yeah. makes me think of MySpace street teams, if anybody remembers right. those <laughs> from way back when. Old school. Um, but uh, it's it's almost like promotion and c building community slash connecting with fans. It is I, I love exactly what Heather the said. same activity. Exactly what Heather was saying. It's like this scene is so punk right now. We are not even to the to the record label, like we're in the Jelly Roll Morton phase of the music industry right now. Nobody has any idea what's going on. Fans are getting involved. People are trying all kinds of different stuff and to just allow it to happen is so exciting. Um, another mistake we made and something we learned from is we should have spent more of our time and money on audio first. Audio is the king and queen of the live stream kingdom. Video can be really iffy. It can, video can be terrible. If the audio is great, it actually makes the video look better. If the audio is terrible, people will go somewhere else. It doesn't matter how cool it looks. If the audio is hard to listen to, people will go somewhere else. Uh, and we had that. Another thing we learned is protect your bandwidth. So we actually pay for our own DSL at the club and we use an ethernet cable and we password protect it. Nobody can get on it except for us. So when we use the Kraken's DSL, the Kraken is the name of this little roadhouse we play at. Um, even with internet, people in the club would go on Facebook Live when something cool happened. Johnny took a guitar solo and people go on Facebook Live and we'd get kicked off of the live stream. And that, I can't even tell you how disastrous that is. You lose the majority of your audience people have to find the live stream again, which is, it's kind of difficult to find a live stream in the first place, especially for people who are new um, at finding the live stream. So you lose a huge percentage of your audience if you get kicked off. I mean, don't let it stop you, keep at it, please. But just be aware that bandwidth is an issue. If you're getting kicked off, it's a bandwidth issue. Also, there's like the Netflix golden hour after dinner until bedtime. Everybody's online, they're watching movies, they're Zoom conferencing with their friends, whatever. Test your upload speed during that time so you get a real world estimate of how much upload speed you actually have. We found that eight megabytes per second is kind of, that, that's really the minimum of what we need for 1080p, 30 frames per second live streaming. More is better. Five megabytes per second is a minimum, and there, like audio and video is shoddy. We would actually bust our video down to 720p to to have a, a better audio experience. Uh, okay, 
I'm going to interrupt point. you, not because okay. everybody doesn't want to hear about this, but because we are considering this particular webinar to be a sort of overview process of all of the aspects of successful streaming. We are going to have a specific webinar on the 28th of April that delves into the MVPs and the PRXs. I don't even know, but we are going to have one that's specific to that. Right. And so I do want to ask you, Jonathan, to speak very briefly to something that was a huge volume of the questions we received, which is what are some of the ways that you earn money from live streaming? And I did see your incendiary Instagram live IGTV moment from yesterday. Um, full disclosure, uh, in which you said people should not be charging for online yeah. concerts. And so I'll ask someone else in the group about what they're doing too, but it, maybe you want to take one or two minutes. To speak well, to one mistake that we never made is we never charged for access. We just invited fans because we, we were terrible. I mean, we had a phone in the corner. I mean, it was terrible. It, we, people would be like, your camera's upside down. Like your camera's upside. The camera was upside down. It was terrible. So having that feedback was essential for us building, building a good program. Um, but right now, my very strong opinion is that this is the wrong time for a paywall. It is the wrong time for ticketed events. First of all, there's a moral issue. 22 million Americans have filed for unemployment this month. Do you want to turn them away? I don't want to turn them away. They need us more than ever. If you're really concerned about how they can help you, they can provide an irreplaceable value just by sharing your live stream with their friends and getting you more viewership. Second, there's a business issue. Right now is an incredible time to grow your audience. Everyone is online looking for something to do. Our online audience grew by 1,000% immediately after lockdown. The first show that we did after lockdown, we had 1,000% more viewers on our live stream and it's just grown from there. Like don't even think about money, think about viewership. Think about inclusion. Think about getting people together. Think about community. And you will make money. We make more money now than we made in the club. Right, but Don't how are you making that money if you're not using a paywall? All we do, all we do, we have a, we, we put a little, I made a little graphic for the screen and it's got our PayPal address. It's got our Venmo address. I hold up the tip bucket and I say, put your tips in the bucket. We got some money in there. Like I make it fun. I mention it two or three times for every set and people are very generous. Um, so we, we get $100 tips all the time. We get $5 tips. I'm sure a lot of people watch and they don't tip because maybe they can't. And just I just say, please welcome. Come to our community, enjoy yourself, share the live stream. That's almost like saying, put a tip in the bucket, share the live stream because everybody who shares the live stream and also increases our income. Right, so you're thinking about value as not yeah. just being monetary value. There's there's various yeah. ways in, in which people can demonstrate their appreciation of the value of what you're giving and yeah. offer you value in return. Absolutely. I'm going to move and to our I, next I just, panelist. I just can I can I just make one? Yep. I want to make one sure more can. point. The third yeah. point is inclusion and diversity. When we started playing the crack, and I'd played for 20 years in listening rooms, people pay 20 bucks to get in. I, if I had a person of color in the audience, it was like, ah, oh, it's a miracle. I like, I wanted to go give them a hug. If I had a 30 something person in my audience, I'd be, oh my God, we have young people tonight. We have kids in the audience. When I started playing the Kraken for free, every, every week we have people of color, we have factory workers, we have farmers who come in who have 20 bucks to put in the bucket. They would not have paid 20 bucks to get in the door, but they'll put 20 bucks in the bucket every week for two years which equals $2,000, let people in. Don't worry about the money, just let people in. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Punk words of inspiration from Jonathan Bird. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our final speaker and then we're gonna let everybody talk at the same time. We're gonna hear from <laughs> Dan Mangan. Dan is a two-time Juno award-winning and two-time Polaris Music Prize listed musician and songwriter. I'm a huge fan, full disclosure. Dan got his start playing house concerts and small intimate shows and knows the value that they bring to artists and audiences. 
Uh, Dan began a house concert network for artists on his label in 2015. This caught the imaginations of so many, it has expanded into Side Door Access, which is a platform that matches artists with hosts, so a bit of a different setup, builds direct connections, and simplifies the show booking process with easy and transparent digital tools. Hi, Dan. Hello. Um, Dan, can you... I'd love for you to just jump off of Jonathan's last answer about um, I'm gonna throw how... a big wrench right into the whole plan there, Jonathan. I got I got I got another take here. Um, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Well, so as you say, side source side door started as it's kind of like a like an Airbnb for gigs, right? So any space can be a venue, a living room, a backyard, a cafe, a juice factory, a warehouse, a campsite, any space. Um, and we uh, we have like a really simple booking interface. The the artist and the host can uh, ne negotiate a split of the revenue, and the show goes on sale. The revenue is held in escrow, and then right after the show, nobody ever has to ask to be paid. Um, everyone that those funds are dispersed based on the pre negotiated split. It's like a simple sort of transparent and super friendly transparent. That's like founding principles. Um, we launched about a year ago. There's about 23, 2,400 artists on the platform, 900, 900 venues in North America, and we booked about 700 shows on the platform. And so we had like this really exciting launch. You know, we, everything was going great. We had a partnership with South by Southwest. We'd book tours down to Austin for all these all these artists. Um, and then of course everything uh, gets canceled. Um, you know, what a, we spent a few days licking our wounds, and then um, we. Figured, okay, well, I'm a co-founder. I'm also an artist, so I can be, uh, you know, a test uh, guinea pig here on the on this uh, on this front. And we are um, we try to show. We did a hard ticket of six bucks, and we instead of doing it through a live streaming platform, um, I figured let's just try something more interactive. Let's just do it through the most immediate thing that was available, which was Zoom. And so that first week, uh, we had about 300 people on a Zoom show, and it blew my mind. And I could not have predicted just how wild the feedback was going to be and how interactive it was. Seeing pages and gallery view of like 25 faces at a time and you can flip through them and there's, you're peering into people's homes and there's the family on the couch with the dog and then there's people who are alone in isolation. There's Chromecasting on the TV. Um, it, it was just like this, this miracle moment where we realized that we tapped into something really special. And I immediately after that had a phone call with my co-founder Laura and we were like, okay, I think the interesting thing here is that what Side Door always did well was we made something great out of something small, right? You know, our sort of unofficial motto was always, if you can't, if you don't have a wide footprint, let it be deep. So if you can't sell 2,000 tickets, blow 60 mines and have the best night ever and make lifelong, you know, uh, supporters out of those people. Um, and also, you know, the thing that we always did well was just like building community and building connection and fostering that through the shared experience of art in, in alternative spaces and what space is more alternative than the internet. Um, and we had, we'd achieved it again. So it was like, you know, we had pivoted the platform, but we actually hadn't changed anything that we were truthfully the, our core sort of value. Um, and I was very curious, you know, nobody was charging for this, especially right in that moment, you know, Chris Martin and Alicia Keys and every celebrity in the world's doing free shows all the time. And every mid-level and emerging artist that I knew was doing the same thing because they just wanted a seat at the table. They just wanted to be included in this world of, you know, everything's happening, it's all free. And I said, what, you know, just let me be the, let me be the guinea pig here. What's going to happen if I do put a paywall on this? And the reaction and the, every little bit of data we've had is that it makes the experience better for everybody. So on Instagram Live, you lose half of your audience after four minutes, guaranteed. On Facebook and YouTube, you're watching the numbers do this the whole time, and eventually they end up just going down. And it's because of retention. It's because it's a passive thing. I'm on my phone and I look at my Instagram live for a few minutes and I go, oh, that's cool, and I move on. When people pay for something up front, even if it's a nominal fee, even if it's just a couple bucks, they put it in their calendar, they make room for it in their life. And what we found is that over 90% of people who had bought a ticket watched 100% of the show. And that number was astounding. Um, in regular side door world, our average artist payout was about four hundred and ninety dollars, and we saw that as like an incredible success. You know that we could, you know, have a have an average of five hundred dollars to 
be paid out on living room shows and books, you know, shows in bookstores and stuff. We've done about 25 of these online shows now, and they're interactive. You can see the audience, the audience can see each other. Um, and our average payout is almost $1,100 on these shows. And it's just been absolutely wild. And we've had this crazy influx of, you know, we used to get like five to 15 users a day. Now we're getting about 30 a day. Um, and these shows are going up uh, quicker than ever. We're, we're sort of adjusting the platform to make it work. But I wanted to share like a couple of the anecdotal sort of money aside, um, just like the experiential things. Um, there was a, we got this amazing email from a mom who just had twins and she has postpartum complications. So she's in the hospital separated from her husband and these two infant babies. And it's obviously stressful enough to have twins in right at this moment of isolation, but the husband doesn't have the support structure of grandparents being able to fly in, et cetera. So she writes me and she has this experience where she's in the hospital and she's watching my show and my music has been a part of their marriage and a part of their life. At the same time, on the same screen, she's watching her husband and the babies who are also watching the show at home and they're watching her in the hospital and they can all see each other and interact while the show is going on. And, you know, she said it was like the first time they felt like a family or just, you know, just wild. There was a, a situation last weekend where uh, Danny Michelle was playing and he noticed a guy playing and strumming a guitar and knew the song. And so he goes, unmute that guy. And the guy takes a verse of the song kills it and then throws it back to the performer. And, you know, I'm watching as, a, as an observer here and I'm seeing just page after page, there's like 600 people on this show and everyone's got their arms in the air. It was like, it's beautiful. You can see dogs and kids and wow. dancing and clapping. And truly, I so firmly believe that the paywall does not have to be big. But if you create a small paywall, you will make more money and you will actually create a better experience for your audience because it cleans, it makes it clean. You don't have to interrupt the show to ask for a donation. And truly, like we, I, I'm so inspired by, by the National Arts Center and the ability that like, you know, the people are, are willing to invest in the intangible importance of art. That is fulfilling to me on so many levels. I also believe that as well as that stimulus, we need a model that will get us out of this and through this period that does not rely on donations. That is a fundamental philosophical belief that I have because if that's gonna, it's gonna dry up and if everybody is, con it's like, I, I, I liken it to live streaming with a, with, a, with a blinder where you can't see who else is watching is like busking in an airport. And there's a million people there potentially, but the actual amount of community and, and engagement that occurs is stifled versus would you have a better experience playing to four or 500 people in a dark, dimly lit, focused club setting where everybody wants to be there? Um, and so I, I just keep coming back to the idea that making sure something is of quality and is, is engaging and is you know, interactively beautiful and community building will always yield a better result than something that is conceivably possibly massive. Okay, we've had a variety of points of view on how to earn money um, by uh, from online presentations. Um, and I think that just speaks to the fact that this is a, a brand new thing for most artists. Um, we have a few questions uh, from our question box and I'm gonna throw one out to the artists uh, here. Um, but before I do throw this beautiful question by Caroline Murphy out, uh, I will say we've had a couple questions about technical aspects of uh, live streaming. We, there will be a webinar. It is linked in the handout that you can see on the bottom of your screen called um, Links and Resources. We are also having a specific webinar next Tuesday with lawyers and rights folks who can talk about the rights uh, issues surrounding live streaming, cover songs, platforms, we are not going to answer those questions today. I am so sorry. I know you want us to, but we cannot get to all of these while well, there's so many. Um, here, <laughs> is, here is a lovely question. And by the way, panelists, congratulations. Speaking of engagement, um, we have lost exactly four viewers since we began today. Hey. And that is an incredible feat. So <laughs> what advice do you have for artists who are nervous about doing a live stream or engaging their audience on a personal level through a digital platform? 
Heather mm. and Chris, thoughts on this question? Well, I would, I guess I almost wish I could have a quick back and forth to, to get more information on what they're nervous about exactly, because as artists, well, mo I mean, I, I am assuming I only know how to be one kind of artist and we mostly engage with our fans anyway after a show. So I'm just wondering, I'm like wondering about a little bit more information about what it is exactly that they're nervous about, because realistically, it isn't all that different from what a lot of us do at the end of a show anyway, when you're standing in the merch line and people are walking by and just wanting to tell you how much they love the show and just engage with you. It isn't, I don't, I don't, I, to me, it hasn't seemed that much different than that. It's kind of I mean, just, the not uh, having applause is, is, yeah. is totally bizarre. And let me just give you permission no to be like, this is really weird. Yay! <laughs> Me! I, by I myself! I will say something that's been happening on Side Door is that like cause w a lot of our shows we find that they do work better if you have a moderator, like a co-host who can kind of administrate it. And so every mm -hmm. now and then, out of nowhere, the co-host will like unmute maybe 50 or maybe like unmute all and all of a sudden there's like 700 open microphones and everyone's going like woo! and it's the, the interface doesn't know which audio to use and it's chaos and it is always like hilarious and everybody kind of goes oh, like good. oh is it? But it does bring like a little bit of life juice into it in that way. Yeah. And I'll say that we do, um, we have a lot of deaf and hard of hearing that follow uh, our music. And Chris and I really like to caption everything. We have uh, some uh, moderating somebody, my partner, Ra, will be like saying what's going on in the show. And so it's really interactive. But one of the things we encourage when we do Zoom concerts is uh, we don't do the whole unmute thing because I feel like I would just freak out in that moment. Although I am missing the sound of applause. I'm not going to lie. Um, but we do, we do applause yeah. and you'll have an entire screen filled with people just going like that and it's honestly like I think my advice that I would give to somebody who is saying I'm terrified to start yes we all are it is super weird I mean right now I'm talking to 280 people or however many people and I'm looking at a tiny little dot on my computer. It is really bizarre, but this is a bizarre time. And you have people who listen to your music um, in times of darkness and in times of great joy. You have a calling. You are here for a reason during this bizarre, weird time in our world. Step up to the plate. They are waiting for you to look awkward on camera. Well, they're feeling awkward watching you, but together we can be awkward and have the and walk and stumble through this thing together. So that's what I, I think. Another say. thing that causes anxiety <laughs> is is the tech element, right? Like people are worried that they don't have their their audio mm -hmm. dialed and stuff like that. Um, and I, I think lean on your friends. Like everybody has a friend who knows a little bit more about this than them. So give them a call and be like, yeah. you know, how did you, you know, how would you do this? How'd you dial your interface in it? Even if you are using your phone, like Jonathan said, phones are amazing. If you don't have condenser microphones or whatever to work, work with, um, you know, for about a hundred or 200 bucks, you can get like an Apogee one condenser, which is just a USB microphone. It has like little stilts. It goes on your table. You can play into it. Mm -hmm. It sounds awesome. And that's like a relatively inexpensive way that you can actually, you know, have like a, a decent audio if you're playing something acoustic. Um, and there's lots of troubleshooting. Google, record yourself, listen back. I mean, the most important investment that you can make is time and just spending the time to figure out like, you know, Jonathan, you're saying you're like, you like, when you, when you start out, like my first concert that I did with this was like me playing into my laptop. And I was lit from yeah. above and I was playing into my laptop and I hadn't messed around with the compression settings in Zoom. So I listened back and I was like, God, that sounds terrible. And then, you know, I figured out how to get my Pro Tools rig in there and actually, you know, I invested in a soft light box that arrived a little while ago. Uh, I bought a 200 foot ethernet cable. So now I can run hardwired internet from my modem upstairs into my studio now. That made my upload speed times seven. Um, it went from like, I don't know, I don't know. It's crazy. So anyway, all of these little things, you can tick every little box and each one will help you have a better presentation. And just to really quickly kind of bridge between one of Jonathan's comments and, and something that Dan was talking about as far as time, just generally as far as the engagement with the fans, if you aren't lucky enough to be sheltering in place with another singer songwriter who also happens to have a partner who can be your pretend intern every time you have a show. <laughs> 
um, just like Jonathan was saying, it is super, super helpful and really just a positive thing to go back. If you're doing Facebook uh, Live, especially to go back through all those comments at the end of it and just engage with them in that way to let them know you actually were really appreciative of the time that they took to make yeah. that comment, to, to give a little smile, to give a whatever, to go back through all those and just engage with them since you were playing and can engage with them in the moment. Um, take the time to do that. It's actually really helpful as far as making them feel seen, um, which again, in this time of isolation, any little thing that helps somebody else feel seen and not so alone is a positive yeah. and will help with their engagement generally, um, especially if you're doing it like we're doing it week after week after week. I keep saying to Heather, it's like, yeah. can you imagine going to Jam in Java and playing this exact same gig like week after week <laughs> after week? Like they would never let us in the door consecutive no. <laughs> weeks, but like our fans keep coming back. back like week after week after week because they're getting something that they need from that. So. It is scary, it's a crazy time, but they are ready and eager to engage with you. Find what it is they need, what it is you can give from yourself and just lean do in. Just do it, just jump. Yeah. Okay, on that note, we only have two minutes left of this time. So before you all go, I've dropped the links to our next webinars in the chat box. Um, to answer a popular question, we had close to 250 people attend today's webinar. Great. That's an excellent Yay. number of people. Um, Heather Gibson, folks are asking how festival organizations and arts organizations, hi Sandra, can best get involved in um, presenting. I think this could be an excellent topic for a future um, FAI presentation, so please everybody stay tuned. Um, and there's going to be a little, um, once you close the window, there'll be a little survey. Please fill it out. Let us know what you want to hear from us. Um, an extra special, super duper thank you to Chris Matthews, Heather May, Heather Gibson, Jonathan Bird, and Dan Mangan. Focalize. Oh. And Atressa, yeah. Yay. <laughs> Everybody, we hope. And Jared you behind the scenes. Jared. And Jared. Yeah. Jared. <laughs> And Jared, we love Jared. <laughs> we hope you find this useful and uh, we look forward to seeing you in a future presentation. Thanks again, everybody. Stay safe and connected to each other and keep on keeping on. See you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. That was fantastic. <laughs>